I'm Tim Jensen. Um, I'm a developer at uStudio. And yeah, I'll be talking about building asynchronous microservices with Tornado. Um, before I jump in, um, I do have example code. You can get the, the complete example code up on GitHub. It's, uh, my, my GitHub is T. Jensen and the repository is PyTexas2017. It's runnable, it has tests, uh, it does require Python 3.6 if you want to run it though. Um, how many of you have heard of Tornado before? Okay, all right, cool. Um, so there's the link for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, it has a web framework, but it's really a, an asynchronous networking library that has uh, web service stuff in it. Um, but you could use it to, to create any sort of service or a client even. Um, so you could implement an FTP server or an FTP client or anything. Um, it does networking. And it integrates uh, or can integrate with async IO and twisted. I'll be, I will be showing some examples of integrating with async IO. Um, and since that's now included with Python, um, Using async IO means you get this growing list of uh, packages um, that you can integrate with. And lastly, it does support Python 2.7 and 3.3 and up. Okay, so why would you want to write your web service to be asynchronous? Well, you get concurrency. Uh, when your web server is asynchronous, you can handle more than one requ more than one request at a time. Uh, and do it in one process. Um, if it were synchronous, you'd have to scale up and run multiple processes. Um, and so it's also lightweight because those extra processes add overhead, memory overhead with the Python interpreter and, and other stuff. So you save some, um, you, you use your compute resources more efficiently when you use uh, asynchronous code. And then when you're using Python 3.5 or newer, you can use async and await, which I think makes it look nicer and it makes the code easier to write. Um, and um, if you want to hear more about that, stay in this room because right after this, Josh is going to be giving a talk on uh, coroutines and um, their history and, and how they came to be in Python. Okay. So what does it take to implement a web server in Tornado? Well, you need four things. You need your application. You need an HTTP server. You need the I.O. loop. And then one or more request handlers. So what goes in the application? Well, your application defines your routes. And it configures your initial state. And when I say state here, what I'm referring to are things like connections to databases or other services, that sort of thing. Oops. Um, so here's an example of, an of creating an application. Uh, we instantiate the Tornado application class. Uh, you pass in a list of your routes, um, which are just tuples of, um, uh, uh, they can be regexes. Um, and, the, and if you have capture groups in your regex, uh, the values that get captured get turned into arguments to the handler methods. And then each one of these routes is associated with a request handler um, class. And then the other last piece of this is, um, you can pass in keyword arguments which define your application settings or your state. Um, in, in this example, um, I'm just passing in my Mongo database connection. But we, all we have now is an application. We don't have a way to talk to it. And the way you talk to it is by creating a server. And an HTTP server is, uh, or enables HTTP access to your application. And it listens on a port. So if you want to instantiate an HTTP server, you pass in your application object that we just created, and then you call listen with the port number, and optionally you can pass in uh, local host if you only want to listen on the local interface, but you don't have to do that. Uh, but the server won't actually accept any connections yet because we need to start the IO loop, and that's what uh, gets things working. It's uh, what makes it go. And, um, the way you start the I.O. loop is you get the current I.O. loop from Tornado, and then you call start on it. And generally, this is going to be the last thing that happens in your main, um, and that start will, or your control will, will remain in start until the I.O. loop stops. Okay. 
And then the last piece are your request handlers. And this is where all the work is going to get done. Here's a very, very simple request handler. Uh, we subclass the request handler class and uh, define our get method. And then in this case, all we're doing is returning some text in the response body. Um, in this case, it's a uh, hi ho neighborino. It's kind of your equivalent of a hello world in Tornado. Uh, not very useful. You probably want to do more than that. You want to talk to databases. You want to talk to other services. So let's look at Mongo. Uh, normally, you might use PyMongo to talk to Mongo in Python, but we're going to use Motor. Motor is an asynchronous interface to Mongo. And you can get to the documentation here. And the API is very similar to PyMongo. Uh, the difference is that most of the methods uh, return futures. So the first thing we need to do is, in our main, we need to set up our connection to Mongo using motor. And so in main, we create the motor client instance here, passing in uh, the Mongo database URL. And then we get the, here we're getting the default database. You can set that in the URL, or you can, you can also you know, call methods to get specific databases by name. OK, and then in the handler, we want to be able to read. So here I've defined a get method. And you'll see that I've added the async keyword so that we know this is an asynchronous get method. And then the next line, we're pulling the, uh, the database connection out of our settings, our application settings that we set up in main. We get the homers collection, and we call find one on that collection. That's going to return a future, so we need to await the result of that future, and that gives us the document in that collection. Or if find one were to raise, maybe because our connection was lost or, or whatever, um, that exception gets stored in the future that it returns, and then when you await that, that future, it gets re-raised. And so you can actually, if you want to, you can, you can wrap this, uh, this line here. Yeah. Uh, in a try, accept. Okay, and then we're just uh, checking if it's none, returning a 404 in that case. Otherwise, we return the content of that document. And this code, if you've ever used PyMongo, will look very similar to what your PyMongo code looks like, but with async and await added. And that's it. So it's pretty easy to make your Mongo code asynchronous. And uh, similarly, Here's our write. Um, we have a post method. It's asynchronous. Again, getting the collection out of the database. And here we're calling replace one, which returns a future. We await the result of the future. Um, and that allows us to wait until the replace is done. And then we re finish the response. OK, so that's Mongo. What about uh, Redis? So I'm going to use AIO Redis as my interface to Redis. This is uh, async I.O. based. You can get the documentation at, at this link. And this is part of the AIO libs uh, GitHub organization. They have a whole bunch of, whole bunch of async I.O. based uh, libraries. Um, they're kind of trying to, it looks like they're trying to async I.O. all the things. Um, lots of good stuff there. They have uh, MySQL and other stuff too. Uh, okay. So when you're going to use an async I.O. library, the first thing you need to do in your main is configure Tornado to use the async I.O. event loop. And this is how you do it. It's this long uh, line here, but we're calling install. And that installs the async I.O. event loop as our Tornado I.O. loop. And you want to do that before you do anything else um, that might use the async I.O. event loop. And you can even do this if you're not using async I.O. Or other async I.O. libraries. Um, and there may be some, some benefits uh, performance-wise to doing that. OK. The next thing we need to do is we need to connect to Redis. Um, and so here I have a function. It's asynchronous that uh, calls the create Redis function in AIO Redis. It just takes the port and the, or the host name and the port. And we await that to get the connection object. But we need to do this in main before we start the I.O. loop. 
So one way to do that is you get the tornado IO loop and you call run sync. Um, now run sync expects you to pass in a function. We need to be able to pass more than just the function, we, or we need to be able to pass in the environment to that function. So here I'm using partial to do that. You could also use a lambda. Um, or since we're using async IO, another way you could do this is you get the async IO event loop, call run until complete on that event loop. And that actually has a slightly nicer interface because you can pass in the, the coroutine object that's returned um, instead of a function and it looks a little cleaner. But since I'm doing a tornado talk, I figure let's do it the tornado way. Okay. So now we set up our connection. Now we'll have our handler. And we're going to read. So we have a get. Again, it's async. Um, we call, we get the Redis connection out of our application settings, call get. And that returns a coroutine object. So we await to get the result. And again, if there is no result, we return a 404 or return the, the value. And this should look pretty similar to if you were, uh, if you had code that was using something like Redis Pi, but again, adding the async and await keywords in the right places. And the right, very similar. We're calling set, awaiting the result. Okay, so some of you maybe have used AWS, and in particular, S3. So how do we do that? Um, you probably, if you've done this in Python, you've used bot03, which you can get, or you can read the documentation for that at that uh, URL. But unfortunately, it's not asynchronous. But we can make it work. Now, there are asynchronous alternatives. In fact, the AIO libs organization has uh, a package called AIO Bato Core, and it has partial support for some AWS services, but that includes S3. But um, I wanted to use Bato3 so I can show you how to, to make this work. So we're going to write a wrapper class that gives us that asynchronous behavior. And so here we're defining an S3 object class, and it's going to have a thread pool executor. And you can set how many workers you want that executor to have. And then in our init, we're just connecting to that bucket in S3. And here we have an underscore upload. And all it does is call the Bato3 method upload file obj, which is synchronous. But we're using the run on executor decorator to cause it to be Submit, um, yeah, submitted to the thread pool executor and run on a different thread. And that returns a um, concurrent, uh, concurrent dot features dot future. And we need to turn that into a tornado future so we can await it with the um, tornado IO loop. So we have our upload method down below that's asynchronous and it's converting the future to the right type and awaiting the result. Okay, so now we have our wrapper class and we can implement our handler. And it's pretty simple. We just call it, we get that S3 object instance out of the application settings and we call upload on it. And that's returning a future so we await the result. And not, not shown here, but in the example code on GitHub, you can see the download as well. All right, so what if you're trying to access something that doesn't have a library? Or maybe it has a library, but um, it's not asynchronous, and it's maybe relatively trivial to implement it yourself rather than trying to wrap it. You could use the Tornado async HTTP client class. Um, it's a simple client. It's suitable for most needs. And they do have a PyCurl-based implementation if performance is an issue or some sort of compatibility prob problem arises. I would say that the um, the interface to uh, async HTTP client is about on par with the requests library. So you may have used requests. Um, one key difference there is that it does raise on default, uh, raise on error by default. So if you get a 400 error or a 500 error, it will raise, but you can turn that off through an argument. Okay. 
So here's an example of using that async HTTP client library. You instantiate the class up at the top, and you call fetch. In this case, we're talking to the Yahoo weather API to get the current conditions in Austin. And um, yeah, so fetch returns a future. We await to get the response object. And then we can parse it as JSON. And then finally, I re return in, in our result some text that says, here's the current temperature, and you know it's mostly cloudy or whatever in Austin. All right. So the last thing I wanted to show you was how to um, how to do multiple asynchronous operations at the same time. You can do that using the tornado multi function, and you can pass in to this function either a dictionary or a list of futures or coroutine objects. In this case, I'm using a list, and it will run them all in parallel. And then, if it if they return anything, you're going to get that back as either a list or a dictionary depending on, you call, on how you called it. And if one of them raises, one of those um, functions were to raise, it gets bubbled up by default as well. And that's it. Um, again, I encourage you to check out the, uh, the example code if you're interested. Um, so I hope I've convinced you to, to use or at least evaluate Tornado and to maybe write some asynchronous code. And um, yeah, if any of this looks interesting to you, um, come by the U Studio booth. We are hiring. <laughs> any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, are there alternatives to run sync? So is it a standard, like, uh, is there alternatives? Uh, a standard, I mean, it's, that's the tornado function. I, I guess I, don't, I wouldn't say it's standard. The, the async IO library, if you use the event loop uh, class directly, has run until complete that basically does the same thing. So it's running an asynchronous function synchronously, waiting for the result. Yes. Um, so the question is, any performance issues? Um, can I think it it performed as expected. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. <laughs>